Thank you, Bonnie. All right, let's get started then. Um, before, before I welcome Mary, I just wanted to open the day uh, by acknowledging the land on which we are standing or sitting or desking. Maybe all the more important because we're so rooted in place these days, so good time to reflect on that. But uh, more formally, I'd like to acknowledge that UBC Point Grey campus is situated on the traditional and ancestral and unceded territory of the Musqueam Nation. I'd also like to acknowledge that people are probably joining us from all kinds of places near and far. And so please acknowledge the traditional owners and caretakers of those lands. Um, I am very pleased to introduce Mary Collins, whom you know already is Assistant Professor of Environmental uh, and Environmental Social Scientist with SUNY ESF or College of Environmental Science and Forestry in the state um, of New York University system. Um, I have already had the absolutely distinct pleasure of working with Mary during her postdoc at UCSB as part of a long-term project with the Center for Nanotechnologies and Society. That work was led by Barbara Herr Hawthorne and was something Melinda and I were both involved in for some time. Um, but let me tell you a few things about Mary that her bio doesn't reveal. Um, she has a really unusual blend of skills, which I describe as an amalgam of kind of deep social theory of environmental justice and disproportionality, or what is now coming to be called that. And, and yet she's also super impressive in that big data meets GIS skills sort of way. I just can't say enough about that. And you might also not know that you know her because um, she was really the point person, I'd say, for by a Washington Post, at least, for the coverage on contamination when Flint, Michigan was being covered heavily in the contamination of water system there. And she's done lots of work on big polluters, which you might also know, even though you don't know that's Mary, but it's Mary. Um, so, and SUNY clearly thinks um, much of her, they've put her into charge of the center that they're developing there that Mary might mention which is really unusual for an early career person, maybe not even wise, but, <laughs> but <laughs> a high compliment. Um, I won't say anything more. So all in, uh, welcome, Mary. We're just really looking forward to this talk. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I wish that I was uh, in um, British Columbia with you guys, yeah. um, but um, you know, such as the the electronic life that we are living uh, these days. Um, so um, thanks so much, Terry. It's been a, um, you know, I feel like I've worked with you and Barbara for, for so long and uh, it's nice to, uh, to be back, to be back and, and get to see you even if it's via a screen. Um, so can everybody see um, my slides okay and hear me okay? Um, please just yeah yell out or something but if you can't, but. Um, so, you know, yeah, I've spent, I've spent basically since I was a PhD student thinking about um, the distribution of pollution production and why, um, how it happens, why it happens the way that it happens. And as Terry said, um, most of what we find is that pollution production is distributed in a super weird way. Like there are these really significant hotspots of production that could be generated by those who are either you know maybe considered super polluters or considered um, egregious in some in some wild way. And so there's been a lot of papers that I've worked on over the years that have tried to um, understand this pattern. And so um, I'll get into some of the background of that. But um, the title of the talk today is is called Targeted Pollution Management and Employment in U.S. Manufacturing. And, um, you know, I realized that title is like, probably like the least exciting title that I could have picked. Um, and, um, but, but, but needless to say, there's, there's some exciting things to, to, to mention. All right. So uh, before I get going, and just to like, sort of preface, like, what I'm talking about today, which like, um, it's a super pleasure to be here and talk about this, because um, this idea is, is something that I have been working on since about, I guess, March. Um, and 
uh, really it, it came about because I was reading news that looks somewhat like this, even though this happened um, more recently than March, but you know, you'd see these headlines across the um, popular media saying that we have these huge changes in um, sort of the way society is maybe doing production, maybe moving around via transportation or um, you know, or other types of things that were resulting in quote unquote strange effects on air pollution across the globe. And um, these things really varied from like um, accounts of people saying like, um, you know, we're gonna have huge changes in greenhouse gas emissions because there's been all these, um, you know, uh, changes in societal patterns of the way people are acting and there have been different um, sort of unanticipated consequences associated with possibly like um, shipping or, you know, I don't know, Amazon boxes, stuff like that. Like there was just a lot of talk about those things. And one of the things that kept coming up was how great for the environment um, this shutdown was. And to me, I would read these things and think to myself like, well, you know, maybe it is sort of good for the environment if you could you know, hold the rest of society constant, but, you know, on balance, I mean, it's, this is a bad situation for society, right? Like we're dealing with unprecedented um, disease and um, the interconnectedness of the globe has, you know, really um, accelerated, right? The transmission of this thing. And I, I immediately thought about um, the research that we've done that's looked at, um, how the generation of pollution, especially within industrial sectors, is generated by these extremes, right? So um, my my like immediate thought was like, oh well, you don't actually have to shut down the whole economy to get big changes in pollution, and and actually like what you probably need to do is think about um, you know targeted action, and so you know this is the motivation for this project. This is a paper I haven't published yet. Um, we, uh, it's all written and everything like that. I just haven't, um, haven't made it, made it out yet, but I'm excited to, to tell you about it and then um, contextualize it within the topics that, that are, are most um, relevant to my research. So um, as Terry mentioned, uh, I've spent a long time like thinking about pollution generation, especially in industrial sectors. And what we find over and over again is that um, a key feature of society's impact on the environment is its unevenness. And so, you know, I keep coming back to that in everything that I've done. And I think that's why all of this media about how great for the environment COVID was, um, it just, it made me feel like, but we actually don't need to, if we understood and, and like internalized how pollution is generated, then um, we wouldn't think that shutting down the economy is the right way to go. So for example, um, this is there's a 2020 book by Don Grant and colleagues who um, you know, are looking at um, uh, electric power generation and the presence of super polluters. It's an amazing book. It's a 2020 Columbia Press book that um, I really enjoyed. Um, this top 20 greenhouse gas emitters uh, figure comes from NRDC. It's a 2014 paper uh, or white paper looking at um, green, green, greenhouse gas emissions in the United States. And what they found was that um, of the 25,000 emitters in the, in the country, um, about a third of all greenhouse gas em emissions were coming from about 100 actors. And so, you know, where I would hope your head is going is that um, if the problem is distributed in a way where there are these extremes, like, first of all, like, why do those extremes exist? And what are the social systems that support that type of inequality? And then also, you know, what do we do about it? If the problem of industrial pollution or air pollution, um, you know, it's this big, huge problem. And if we could separate it into chunks, then maybe we could target the things that are really causing most of the problem. And we actually know that those, th those places and those actors um, are especially egregious in a bunch of ways, not only in terms of their hazard production, but they often and almost exclusively operate in places um, that are characterized by, um, you know, many more minorities than one might expect and people who are, are living in poverty. So, you know, these are these inju environmental justice um, 
patterns that are extremely well documented among, um, among um, those who have, have done this vivid work. Um, so, you know, it, if I just set the stage um, um, a little bit, so, you know, some societies pollute significantly more than others, some groups within society consume far more resources than others, and some industrial firms contribute much more environmental harm than others. And um, this is something that I have said over and over again. I think it's something that almost everyone I talk to, um, it doesn't seem like earth shattering that this is the case, but time and time again, people don't make decisions that reflect this reality. Instead, they think of things like, oh, well, you know, all, there's an average society out there, or there's an average, you know, if we, if we look at all these groups in total and we, you know, take a mean or something like that, then like that'll describe the situation well. But, you know, if you've looked at any sort of non-normal distributions, you'll know that like a mean is going to be heavily influenced by outliers. And so it's not gonna be a good description. Um, but I'll get to, to that in, in a little bit. So um, within the literatures that I'm, I'm used to sort of interacting with most prominently, um, this term is, was this, this was termed uh, disproportionality by Bill Freudenberg. And he defined it as a strikingly unequal pattern of privileged access to environmental rights and resources that characterize modern societies and economies. And you know, he really contends that it's the social system of privilege that elevates people's access. And, um, and there are, he has a bunch of ideas about the strategies that you know, allow them to maintain such access. But, um, but really this idea of disproportionality is something that, that you know, he at least characterizes as something that is, is, is the norm rather than the exception. And I, I certainly think that um, every time I do one of these projects and it pops out, I think um, I'm surprised every single time, even though I probably should, should be used to it at this point. Um, so what does disproportionality research look like? Well, um, research programs focused on disproportionality as a key aspect of society's relationship with nature are relatively rare um, for a few reasons. Um, be, sort of because like uh, results are kind of disparate across the um, white literature. You, you have to use lots of different search terms to find it. Not everyone calls it disproportionality. And sometimes when these types of non-normalcies show up in the way that harms might be generated or hazards might be generated. Um, sometimes they're characterized as anomalous findings rather than um, ubiquitous ones. But, you know, needless to say, despite them being rare, um, it, it's not that hard to find um, a bunch of these papers. And a lot of them have some striking findings and they, they are quite, quite variable across, um, across settings. So for example, um, within industrial sectors, um, Freudenberg looked at the primary metals industry and he found that you know, one or two polluters in um, in a town in Idaho were causing a huge amount of the problem. And he showed that over um, many different metrics of hazard. Um, Straightwiser looked at the chemical industry specific grant and then a um, subsequent um, work by, by that group also has looked at the electric utility industry. Um, there have been um, comparisons between industrial sectors showing that some, in some industrial sectors are, um, are worse than others, which, you know, isn't too surprising, although um, a lot of times this is a um, problem that happens in the, at, between facilities within sectors. So just because you see um, uh, disproportionalities between sectors, um, you, uh, you. you can still see um, such disproportionalities actually within sectors. Um, but in summary, these studies consistently find this signal that looks like disproportionate distribution of harm generation. And um, they don't typically focus on why. Um, and so much work has just been trying to like document this pattern in a way that is generalizable. Um, and so some of what um, I've tried to do over the past few years is try and, and come up with a bunch of hypotheses as to why this might be the case. Um, so this is like really just something that I've come up with over the years, um, and I'm sure there are more things that could be on this list. Um, this is just a like sort of a research roadmap that I have used over the last, you know, decade or so. Um, and I've thought about like, okay, so 
there are all these things that you can um, use to describe why a facility or how a facility acts. Um, this is mostly in the context of industrial pollution. So, you know, maybe it's its environmental context, like it's maybe it's not really about what the facility does or doesn't do. Maybe it's more about where the facility is located, like it happens to be in a very vulnerable um, part of the landscape. Um, and there are some work, there's some work out there that does show that environmental context does matter and that two like facilities that are cited in different places can have different environmental impacts. Um, the second category is the social context. And I would say that this one has been um, probably um, one of the most um, um, uh, clear linkages between sort of the industrial system and, and the system of inequality that um, those who focus on environmental justice talk about. So um, things like we know that community demography and um, um, you know various other things associated with how a facility might function in a community in terms of contributing a, a, a critical good or a um, something to a local tax base, for example. Um, we also know that endogenous and exogenous facility characteristics are, of course, going to matter. So um, things like how do these facilities act? Do they have pollution controls installed? Um, are they, um, you know, are they in zones of sort of high regulatory inspection or high regulatory surveillance? Um, so so basically um, what I'm interested in, in, in doing today is, is sort of building off some of what I've listed here, which are um, you know, maybe um, some aspect of the way that these facilities um, um, either contribute to um, the local community by via employment metrics or um, are doing thing, you know, are doing something right that that um, matters for for um, sort of justifying their their um, sort of over pollution, if you will. So um, what I was really interested in doing was challenging some sort of simple view of a jobs environment trade off, and um, this is important because um, one of the things that we hear about all the time in this world, um, and almost every talk that I give, somebody mentions this is. Um, what if um, you know you do some sort of regulatory action, and what happens is that a facility shuts down, and then it a bunch of people lose their jobs and, and stuff like that. And so this is really an effort to try and understand, like, well, what's the relationship between doing some sort of um, environmental action and um, jobs at, at at these different facilities, um, accounting for disproportionate pollution production, of course. So. Um, there's some evidence to, to think that this might be a good idea. So it's pretty common to assume that there's some sort of proportional relationship between environmental pollution and economic activity. Um, and for the most part, I think almost everyone who claims this doesn't um, meaningfully incorporate the fact that pollution is produced in a disproportionate way. And so you wouldn't really expect that, um, you know, such regulations would be, um, um, would, would also act that way. Um, also, we know that the majority of U.S. manufacturing industries, uh, in the majority of U.S. manufacturing industries, about 20% of facilities are generating 90% of pollution within those industries each year. And that's very stable over time. Um, in that paper, we looked at, um, you know, almost 20 years of data, um, and we included like four or 500 different um, NAC sectors and, you know, thousands and tens of thousands of facilities. Um, <clears throat> Lastly, and I mean, although today I'm not looking at um, EJ class, EJ um, community variables as prominently as I sometimes do, um, uh, you know, most researchers have really focused on identifying this underlying pattern. And we know that, um, we just know that like communities that are living really close to these egregious industrial actors are most likely to be those who are members of environmental justice communities. And we also know that they're certainly not adequately represented in the workforce of those um, of, of those types of, of um, industrial actors. So 
you know, what, what did I end up doing? Um, well, I was really interested in simulating industry-based shutdowns, facility-based shutdowns, and various control ideas. And I, um, although this really isn't about um, the sort of claims that people were making about changes in um, sort of societal patterns associated with COVID, um, that's, that was the jumping off point for it. So what I wanted to do was I, I, I um, wanted to understand, understand different management um, simulations. So for example, um, I wanted to know um, the effect of, um, on the effect on hazard and employment for um, various scenarios as compared to a business as usual scenario. And I'll get into the specifics of, the, um, of, of what I did in a second, but essentially, I did a bunch of, of simulations where I shut down industries that at random, I shut down industries that were the worst of the worst, you know, the 25% worst industries, the 10%, the 1%. I did that at the facility level. And then I used an industry benchmark facility performance standard where I um, said, okay, well, what if I took the worst of the worst and I compelled them in some way to, um, uh, to, uh, you know, reduce their emissions to the max of those industries, of those facilities that are in the same industry. Um, so um, I'll show you the results in just a sec. So I used um, two uh, pretty large data sources. The first is from the US Environmental Protection Agency. And the second is a proprietary database called the National Establishment Time Series Database that um, I had to purchase. So the first data source is the toxic release inventory, which you might be familiar with, um, and the risk screening environmental indicators, which is called RECI. These two um, data sources are really, um, one's a derivative of the other. Um, they are, um, it's, a, it's a database of facilities that um, hold hazardous waste permits. And every single year, according to the Emergency Planning and Community Right to Know Act in the United States, these types, anyone who holds these permits has to report to the federal government about their, um, what they released and how much they released. And um, um, one of the things about TRI that can be problematic is that its um, metric is pounds and sometimes like a pound of, of, of lead of course is incredibly heavy and an ounce of chromium is incredibly toxic. But if you compared pounds to ounces, of course pounds looks, looks like a pound of lead is, is a lot more than a ounce of chromium even if the health effects are probably, you know, not as comparable in that way. So what RECI does is it toxicity weights that and um, it uses an air model. And then um, um, you can make sort of cross chemical comparisons. And so for this project, I used RECI, but I like to mention TRI because that's where it came from. Um, the second database I use is the National Establishment Time Series data, the NETS data, which I talked about. Um, this is a time series database of more than 50 million establishments in the United States, and you can crosswalk it to the toxic release inventory. And what the National Establishment Time Series database has in it is like they have a million variables in there. Um, I only used one variable um, for this project, but um, I, uh, which is just uh, the number of employees at, at each facility. So I crosswalk these two using a, um, a crosswalk that I established between uh, DUNS number and TRI facility identification number. And this was a little bit hairy, I would say. Um, this crosswalk had to be generated in collaboration with EPA and with um, the owner of the NETS data. And um, it, it was a little hard to, to, to make it happen, but, um, but in the end, um, we were able to do this. We had about a 92% merge success rate um, in terms of, you know, after we cleaned each of the data sources. And in the end, um, the analysis that I'm about to show you has, has about um, 26,000 facilities uh, spanning across the entire continental United States. Um, it covers 393 sectors and I have a, a time horizon from 1998 to 2012. Um, I did do some data cleaning, so I'm only including uh, sectors that had at least five facilities reporting every single year, and each facility had to report for the entire um, uh, reporting time frame from 98 to 2012, but I still had a lot of, of, um, of, of facilities. Um, so for the analysis, I looked facility by facility. I did things like um, look at the total hazard released by industry and by facility. I looked at the total number of employees that um, um, were, you know, within industries and within at facilities. And then what I did was is 
for every single simulation that I did, I looked at the change in emissions and the change in the number of employees resulting from the simulation standardized to the proportion of emissions or employees that would have just been happening if we continued business as usual. And, and you know, I have a bunch of results for you. So um, this is just a blank table. Um, and I was just gonna, I'm gonna show this to you just so that you can um, uh, get used to what we're looking at. So I have, you know, the years, the study years across the x-axis and then the proportion of business as, as usual scenario. So if it's, you know, if the line is up at one, then basically the simulation didn't do anything because business as usual is, 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 uh, is, is wholly maintained. So as I mentioned, um, I did, I did a bunch of, um, I started with doing whole complete industry shutdowns and I had a bunch of scenarios that I tested. So the first one was just a random shutdown. So say I just randomly selected 25% of industries and I shut the whole industry down. And, you know, in some ways, like this is a bit analogous to what was going on um, during um, the COVID situation, um, you know, albeit maybe a little more extreme and, and not really surprisingly, if you shut down 25% of um, industries, then you lose about 25% of the hazard that those industries generate and you lose about 25% of um, employees. Um, and then there was a bunch of other uh, shutdowns that I did. So the, the second one I did was, well, well, since we know that these pollution um, generation um, profiles are, are not normal and are, might be closer to a log normal distribution or something like that, which are described um, more completely by a median, what I did was is I you know, pulled the, the, the median out for every single um, industry. And then I sort of flanked 12 and a half percent on each side. And, you know, this is, you know, in some ways this is intuitive after I did it, but, but, but if you shut down 25% of industries based on the um, median, you know, surrounding the median, you get almost none of the hazard, right? So almost, you know, you still lose like almost 25% of employees depending on the year. But you you basically don't in, you don't impact the hazard at all, and that's because like you don't get any of the extreme polluters when you do that type of scenario. So the last three, three scenarios are are really um, the more interesting ones. Um, in this case, I shut down the worst twenty five percent of industries. So um, when you shut down the worst twenty five percent of industries, you can see that like you decrease the um, the the business as you per business as usual hazard down by like it's more than 95% basically you essentially get rid of almost all the hazard by shutting down 25% of industries but there's a pretty strong cost or a pretty painful cost associated with employee loads you lose almost half the employee um, workforce when you do that um, the, the other two simulations that I did um, were to target the worst 10% of industries and the worst one percent of industries, and you can see that the pattern is is definitely different. So, um, when you target um, the the worst ten percent of industries, you can impact about um, you know between fifteen and twenty percent of um, of hazard is is left. So you eliminate you know almost eighty you know more than eighty percent of of all the hazard, um, and you lose about twenty five percent of employees. So that's um, comparable to the um the the random shutdown in, in terms of employees and and the last simulation i did at the industry level was um to look at um targeting just one percent of industries so i shut down the worst one percent of industries and what happens is you see um you you still um you know you don't impact uh hazard as much i mean but you're still getting almost half of hazard on average although there is this like kind of weird dip here and, um, but you maintain like quite a lot, almost all employees, you have a very um, low impact on um, the number of employees in these different industries. Um, you are probably thinking like, nobody's gonna shut down like an entire industry, right? And you know, you're probably right. This is kind of a thought experiment. Um, so the next thing I did was, is I decided to shut down um, the worst facilities and I did the same procedure, right? So I looked at, um, shutting down the worst, the you know, a random 25% of facilities. And again, you know, that one's not that surprising. You lose about 25% of, of hazard and you lose about 25% of employees, which is similar. Um, if you shut down um, based on the median, it's also very similar. You barely impact the hazard. That's because you don't get any of the worst egregious actors. You're bouncing around the median. 
um, and you still lose a lot of employees. So that's clearly like the worst plan. Um, and then if you look at the 25, 10, and one, um, it's similar, right? If you if you target the worst 25% of facilities, you eliminate almost all of the hazard, and you eliminate you know about 40% of, of of jobs. So that's that's still kind of painful. Um, and then these last two, the 10% and the 1%, again, um, the pattern is pretty similar. If you target the worst 10%, you um, are doing you know really well with hazard, and you're you know cutting about 20% of jobs depending on the year. And if you target the worst 1% of, of facilities, you um, are going to you know, decrease your hazard by about 65 to 75%. And the impact on employment is, is, not, is not as painful. Um, you know, this might be a step toward um, a more granular um, sort of management strategy. Um, but um, the last thing I wanted to do was to try and um, do this in a way where um, maybe it was a, a little more realistic. So the last um, set of scenarios was avoiding a complete shutdown. And instead of you know compelling an entire industry or you know some you know really egregious facilities to you know completely shut their doors and you know fire their employees, my thought was well. Maybe we could just look at um, within the industry. So for every single facility, I knew what industry it was part of. And what I did was, is I took the worst 25% of actors um, in this case, and I did it for 10 and one as well. And I compelled them via some sort of, you know, um, uh, you know, policy instrument potentially to decrease their, um, their hazard to the maximum of facilities that operate in the exact same industry. So this is a real world thing where like there are facilities that are classified exact in the exact same industry and you know are performing a lot less. So are, 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 are producing a lot less hazards. So if you compel the worst 25% of facilities to decrease their hazard down to the maximum, um, not including um, that 25% of course, um, the, the results are kind of interesting. So you lose no employees because like I haven't closed any facilities. Um, and um, you see a, a pretty big decrease in hazard. Hazard is down below 25% of business as usual. So that's a pretty good result. And, and the patterns are, are similar um, for the 10 and the one case where you, you have a little bit um, fewer, a little bit less of a decrease in hazard, but again, no decrease in, um, in employment. And, and for the 1% case, um, you also have a pretty significant, this is targeting 1% of facilities and not shutting them down, just decreasing their total hazard to, you know, the maximum of the, of, of their, their like industries or their counterpart facilities. Um, and again, there's no decrease in employment because I didn't shut anyone down. And there's about a 25%, although it bounces around a little bit by, by year. Um, so the last thing I, I wanted to do was to just take these 13 scenarios and, and compare them to one another, right? So here I'm just taking all of the scenarios that I just presented, so those 13 scenarios and comparing them um, in terms of, you know, some sort of trade-off frontier is sort of how I'm thinking about this. Although I know that this isn't 100% um, typical for, for maybe you economists out there. But if this is, you know, sort of like a trade-off frontier here, maybe where it's like, you know, you kind of want to be up in this corner, right? Because you've got, um, this is the proportion of um, hazard reduction. So 100% would be like 100% reduction of business as usual hazard. And this is the proportion of, of employees. So you really want to maximize the number of employees you keep and you want to maximize the hazard reduction. So it's, um, it's, it's the, it's the, you know, simulations out here where you might be getting um, sort of the maximum benefit um, at the, you know, minimum minimum cost um, of employees. Um, so you can notice that like my two median um, um, uh, actions uh, or simulations out here are, are sort of like bad performers, right? They're like terrible at um, hazard reduction um, out here and they're, you know, um, you know, not as bad, I guess, in terms of, of, uh, of, of employment, but they're still, we're losing like lots of employees um, and basically getting no hazard, um, hazard, ha hazard for it. Um, uh, so five minute reminder. Thank you. Thank you. Um, 
so I only have have a few a few more thoughts to go. So, um, as I mentioned, um, the two simulations that stand out as the most effective um, in meeting both the goals, the in meeting both the goals of sort of maximizing hazard reduction and minimizing job loss, would be um, there, there were sort of two that emerged as as the most um, effective. So this one, the performance 25% target and this facility targeted 10% one. So what those were, were um, if you target um, the worst 10% of facilities and shut them down, um, you, you know, that seems like one of the most effective um, options. And so it's not shutting down the entire, it's not shutting down any industry. Like there, there's no industry that just goes away by doing this facility targeting. Um, and so, and, and for scale here, so there's about 25,000 facilities included, but that's across every single year. So there's about 16,000 or so facilities that operate every year. And um, you end up with like, you know, targeting about 10% about of those to, to get a, um, a pretty good reduction um, in, in, in hazard and a, you know, maintenance of a, a decent maintenance of, of number of employees. Um, the other one that was really interesting, and I think the one that I'm most interested in continuing to explore, is um, where you target 25% of actors for performance impro improvement. And you know, I think I I gave a pretty conservative performance um, um, improvement goal here, where these facilities just have to decrease to the maximum of their um, you know counterpart facilities, basically. Like, so they don't have to make changes that seem really illegitimate to me. I mean, they just have to be like the worst of the group that's the least worst, sort of. Um, um, I thought that the, the, ne the next takeaway I have is that the median center shutdowns um, at both the industry and the facility levels were certainly the least effective in, si in simultaneously meeting the pollution reduction and employment protection goals. And they produce, you know, almost a 25% decline in employment and have almost no effect on toxic hazards. So, you know, that thing seems like clearly like the wrong way to go. And I mean, they're actually worse than just doing random shutdowns, um, um, which result in a direct trade off between employment and hazard and both drop to about 25%. Um, I have a few other sort of meta takeaways um, in the context of sort of research on um, disproportionate pollution production. Um, these choices to, well, first of all, like, there's some optimism in the United States these days with the Harris Biden administration coming in in the context of environmental justice and and you know pollution control, and I think that um, we know that egregious actors are much more likely, if not exclusively, acting in environmental justice communities. So, making choices that maximize um, things like um, you know pollution reduction and um, maximize protection for employment are um, you know, certainly really important variables, I think, and palatable for the way that you know, we talk about pollution and regulation and you know, economy environment trade-offs and stuff. But um, you know, I think it would not be, um, you know, the best way to contextualize this is that these egregious actors are almost exclusively acting in environmental justice communities. So, any any targeted action is likely going to both result in significant release reductions in pollution generation and are is potentially going to be happening in places where um, disproportionate impacts are occurring and legacies of um, you know fence line community um, action ha ha has gone on um, for 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 decades um, I also really like these approaches because I feel like it takes this big problem of um, industrial air pollution. And instead of focusing on 25 or 35,000 actors, um, you really only have to focus on 10% of them or 25% of them. And, you know, or less than that, really, you'd still get a lot of goal, a lot of, a lot of gains um, by focusing on fewer, but you have to write, pick the right ones, right? And I tend to feel like we live in an era where, you know, I can, um, you know, be machine learned about like what type of socks I want to buy. I don't understand why we shouldn't be really using very um, sophisticated modeling and data-driven approaches to do inspection targeting, do facility management, do these types of, 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 
of action. So um, we've worked pretty closely with US EPA with some of these uh, simulations to try and make sure that they have um, some policy relevance. And you know, it's been a pretty fun project for um, you know this this phase of of being of being uh, locked down. And I'm sort of lucky in some ways that the research that I do has um, has you know is mostly me and my computer. So um, I haven't had to like shut down labs or anything like that. Um, but um, this work was was supported from the had benefited from support from the National Science Foundation. Um, uh, and I have worked very closely with my graduate student, Dustin Hill, and with my uh, close colleague, Simone Pulver at UCSB. And um, really this work is somewhat emergent. Um, I do have a, I have written a paper about it, but I haven't submitted it anywhere. So any, um, any thoughts would be, would certainly be welcome. I'm happy to take any questions and I, I just really appreciate um, uh, the invitation to talk today and I'm happy to, happy to take any questions you might have. Thanks, Mary. Uh, yeah, that was just a terrific big picture and fine grained mix of things. And there are questions popping up all over the place in the chat. Okay. I will uh, follow our protocol. Um, maybe you can stop screen sharing if you want, although we might want to go back sure. to some slides. Um, but for now, I will uh, start with student, student questions. So okay. jump in. That side of the equation. Rudri, I see you have your hand up. Anyone else? Sorry if I've missed it, please ping me. And I see that Nigel has raised his hand as well. So, um, Rudri. Okay. Um, thanks, Mary. Uh, that was a really great presentation. I had a couple of questions. Um, could you unpack the policy actions required to reduce the hazards um, by decreasing to the best, uh, uh, best performing industries as well as what would the costs and incentives be for these industries, the worst emitting industries, to reduce their hazards? Um, well, you know, start out with an easy one there. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I don't really know um, exactly what the costs would be. And, um, you know, when we spoke to some of the people at EPA that are working with the pollution prevention law, so at e in, e in the US, there's one pollution prevention law that sort of like um, uses um, a, a sort of carrot approach, if you will. So it's like they're trying to highlight the best actors and um, celebrate their their actions. And so um, they don't often look at the side of, I, of it that I look at because um, I typically look at the worst actors, you know? Um, and so if I was to like unpack what it means to like decrease to the maximum of the like least worst actors or something, um, that was just something that we, we were, that they suggested to us as like, well, what if you kind of were conservative and you took these worst actors and you decreased them to something that was realistic? And so what we decided was realistic was the maximum of the sort of least worst actors. Um, how that would be accomplished um, and the pain points of that, I think is what you were asking me. Um, we did not spend a lot of time thinking about how that policy would be written or what that policy might look like. And um, I totally, I don't think it's unrealistic to think that like, compelling these worst actors to change might be the hardest part. Um, and so um, I, I'm not, I'm not um, you know, my head is not in the clouds about that, but I do think that um, one of the things that we notice by this pollution prevention law is that um, often facility managers are working um, they're not working at the level of like the process. And there are a lot of facilities that are doing really good things. And so making sure that these worst actors understand like the universe of things they could do to change industrial processes that might result in big emissions or big releases um, is something that is a, is a separate, um, is a separate um, is a separate project. And we have done some of that, like trying to algorithmically match facilities that one facility has really bad emissions and the other facility has really good emissions and they do the same thing. And so it's like, let's get those two talking 
so that they can make choices that um, decrease their footprints because I only have one 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 student that works with me that does interviews, but um, she's done a bunch of facility interviews, um, asking managers like what how they manage the way they do. And often what comes up is like we want to be a good actor. We just don't, you know, we just don't really have the impetus to do that in some way. Like, and so I think like collaborative approaches would be really helpful in, in this vein, although they they weren't really included in this in this specific project. Um, so I feel like I danced around your question and really didn't answer it at all because um, the short answer is that like I don't really know. I, I could imagine that the cost would be quite variable um, and that would be a whole nother project probably. But um, but we have certainly a lot of ideas on, on how to do that. Yeah, thanks for the insight, yeah. Okay, um, we've got a whole bunch of things popping up in the chat here. So I am not sure there's a kind of combined question from Anna and Hadi and one from Nigel. Does either of you want to step forward on? Um, I'm just going to punt the question to Nigel because I saw his hand come up first and then we'll go to Anna slash Hadi. Perfect. Thanks for that presentation, Dr. Collins. It was really cool. Um, so I feel like asking about old papers is a little bit like requesting band hits at a concert for their newest tour, but this one's about your paper uh, with Terry from a few years ago. Uh, you mentioned at one point that environmentally hazardous technologies are viewed as more risky where harms are seen as inequitably distributed, um, but also that high income earning and highly educated white males perceive those hazards as less risky, the white male effect, even though we know that there are things that explain that. Do you think that the diversification of the management of these companies could be a pathway to reducing inequitable, inequitable distribution of environmental harm? Because I don't have the data, but I wouldn't be surprised if the most polluting industries also had the highest proportion of male management. At least it seems that way. Uh, I'm from Alberta and there's coal and oil and yeah. a lot of the people who represent the companies who are the face of the companies are male and often white. Wow. I mean, that's a great question. Um, I we so we haven't done um that you know we haven't done any of that research um and i kn i know that like these data do have um facility management contact information in there and that's how we've done a lot of interviews in the past um so you know i I mean, I love your question. I love the idea of trying to understand. Is what's the base rate already, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, like trying to sort of understand how, um, you know, diversity and management strategies affects um, how, you know, an institution or a facility might perform. I mean, I think that that's a super interesting question. It's definitely not something that I have looked at. Although, um, you know, one, one thing we have looked at is that um, we know that as um, sort of organizational complexity increases, so does these not, so do these non-normal patterns. Um, so like um, organizations that are part of really complicated organizational structures, like that have many parent companies or many, um, you know, international, like multinational type ownership structures are much more likely to be egregious polluters. Um, and you can see some of that through like tracing back ownership um, within um, like some of the um, petrochemical industrial accidents that have happened in Texas and um, the BP oil, oil spill to some extent. Um, but um, I mean, Nigel, I like love your question. I feel like I just, I don't know. Um, I, my intuition is sort of the same as yours that like, you know, we, we would probably um, benefit um, that the pollution would be related to, to you know, diversification um, from a, you know, sort of, at least from a gender and race perspective. Um, but, uh, but I, I, uh, I haven't done that type of inquiry, but I share the same intuition as you. I don't know, Terry, if you, if you. Yeah, no, it's a great question. I, yeah, and it does seem answerable, at least at the management level, if not the diversity of the workforce, but. Um, totally. Thanks, Nigel. Okay. Uh, new, so I think. research area. Yeah, yeah totally. I think that um, we should move on to Anna and Hadi and then to Emmanuel and then we'll open up to the larger group. Hi, thank you so much, Mary. That was really fabulous. Um, I, I kind of added a sub question onto a question that Naveen brought up. So I'll just read his and then I'll add my um, okay. 
addition. So Naveen asked, how was the worst defined? So he was wondering if it was hazard per facility or per industry or normalized to their production or value. And then my kind of follow up to that was um, if the pollutants that are used to classify a facility as worse um, are also pollutants that might disproportionately affect those fence line communities. So I'm wondering kind of what are the justice implications if the pollutants being released are something like lead, mercury that might be directly impacting those communities versus something that's more of like a collective problem like greenhouse gas emissions. Right. Um, Thanks. Um, I'm sorry about that. That was Naveen and Anna. I <laughs> these name was popping up so much in the chat that I uh, misread that. Sorry, Mary, go ahead. Oh, no problem. No problem. So um, the hazards are calculated at the facility level. Um, and so I have a RECI score for every single facility and that score is a, it's a way to compare across chemical. So um, you know, the fate and transport and the way that the chemical, you know, there's a toxicity factor that's multiplied in there. So you're able to compare across chemicals. So um, in some ways we have this metric, right? That's a higher number is a more hazardous emission. Um, and it falls short of being a risk assessment in, in you know, letter of the law ways, but, um, but these numbers are very um, internally comparable and in all, all of that. So um, when I was talking about shutdowns of facilities or changes at the facility level, um, or well, let's talk about shutdowns first, I was talking about you know, simply the worst 25% of, 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 of sort of proportional emissions. And I'm just ranking facilities. I'm calculating the proportion that they contribute among all facilities. And then I'm, you know, cumulative summing them and doing lots of data subsetting. Um, and uh, at the industry level, I'm summing up to the industry level. So everybody who has the same six digit and North American industrial classification code, I'm grouping them and I'm coming up with um, a total for that industry, right? And so the shutdowns are done um, um, in that way. And so it's not normalized by any sort of net generation or you know some sort of normalizer in that way for the shutdowns. Um, for the decreases to the max, um, I did normalize by number of employees um, because I felt like I wanted a size control and I wanted to um, sort of give facilities sort of quote unquote credit for like having lots of employees potentially. So if you had, for example, if you had a facility that was, um, you know, had a lot of employees, for example, um, what I was doing was I was looking at their hazard per employee and ranking those and then establishing the worst 25, 10 or 1% of those facilities and then decreasing that to the maximum for the hazard normalized by hazard per employee um, within each, um, each, each industry. And um, you're right to point out that like that um, normalization is, is really, um, you know, quite basic, I guess I would say, um, although it's, it is accounting for size in some way, right? Like you're assuming that facilities that are bigger might have more employees. Um, and uh, so, um, but, you know, we've done other things like I had another paper we did looking at just the electric power generation sector and in that case, it's super important to, to normalize by megawatt hour because just the bigger places generate more megawatt hours. And so you really want some normalizer to be able to compare there. Um, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm less familiar with, with all of the 300 or 400 industries in this case. So I just divided by number of employees um, for, this, for this one. Um, but in terms of specific pollutants, um, I have been wanting to work with specific pollutant data for like the last decade. And it's just, um, there was all of this aggregate stuff to do sort of to start talking about 
um, specific pollutants. And um, I have one paper that we just did actually that just got published about this and it's a Syracuse paper. And um, what we did was, is we looked at lead, mercury, nickel, chromium and cadmium. Um, and we looked at proximate releases within Syracuse. And then we had, we partnered with a medical professional um, who had done a cohort study looking at blood lead levels and mercury, ca cadmium and chromium. And we were able to show um, how um, proximate releases of these specific chemicals are showing up in people's blood or in kids' blood actually. And so um, I feel like that's an inroad into like writing grants and getting funding to do sort of more chemical by chemical work. Um, there are 800, well, there are 596 chemicals covered by TRI. So each facility can release each of those every year if they are permitted to. And so you can imagine like these matrices get really huge, really quickly. And the computational needs get really huge, really quickly, especially if you want to look across the country or something like that. But I feel like, you know, your, your question about chemical um, specific things um, is exactly where like I want to go. It's not something we've looked at um, um, super directly, except for this Syracuse project. And we did find that, especially in the context of um, uh, cadmium, there were, um, you know, big cardiovascular effects within um, youth in um, environmental justice neighborhoods. So um, that were disproportionately affected by um, disproportionate releases. And so um, it's just, it's it's like, you know, uh, these funders that we write grants to, like they want a clear research um, agenda where you can justify that like doing this huge data mining project, looking at chem all 595 chemicals is, is, um, is gonna be worth it. But um, that's sort of what I would like to do is, is like look chemical by chemical. And I think that like really specific regulatory action that might target chemicals would be a good way to go. Um, because, you know, some facilities are doing lots of different things and not everything is going to be, um, um, you know, needing to be changed. That's how I think about it. Thanks, Mary. Great to hear that's where you're headed. Um, I'm just gonna, uh, Nigel happily sent me questions in order. So I'm gonna go to Hadi's question, then to Emmanuel and then back to Zia and, uh, probably David next, just to give one question. There's a, there's a whole string, so I'll do my best. Go ahead, Hadi. Well, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, uh, I, I think, uh, I think the, the, a lot of the conversation in the chat is about your metrics. Yeah. And whether, um, you know, pollution per unit output or pollution per value added or something like that might not have been, um, more acceptable to say the economists who, who have done yeah. this kind of research for quite some time. And by the way, Hazilla and Kopp, are you familiar with their work? No. Um, they have a famous paper in uh, Econometrica back I think in 86, in which they looked at a four digit SIC facility level inputs and outputs to kind of do more or less what you're suggesting, mm -hmm. which is to encourage the least, the, the the performance of the least polluting for the most polluting and to encourage policy design to go that way. And I thought if you're interested, you might be willing to kind of look that up or I can put you in touch with Ray Kopp uh, because that's certainly been um, an objective of some intelligent policy design. Mm -hmm. um, and that, vastly taken up, I'm sure. Yeah, not taken up, no. <laughs> <laughs> but, but kind of this business of going after the, the hot, you know, the hotspots and the, and the mega polluters is very much the case with the transportation sector, as I'm sure you know. Yeah. Um, and I was wondering if um, in your model that you were describing, you wouldn't expect the company that has, um, has been compelled to become more efficient, wouldn't invest also in getting fewer labor, uh, you know, substituting for labor through capital. Totally. Um, you know, so did, did anyone at EPA comment on that? Um, they did, um, they thought that, um, yeah, I mean, they thought that like, it was too simple to, um, uh, you know, compel this, this, this sort of efficiency move and not have, and, and think that that was like wholly, um, um, 
you know, um, uh, unrelated to changes in employees, because the way that we presented it was that like, oh, we're going to, you know, compel this decrease and not shut anyone down. And therefore there's no impact on, on labor. And um, the way that we wrote up that section um, was that, you know, we kind of understand that these two things are related and we haven't come up with a way to um, do some sort of covariance thing with them or something like that. Um, and so inroads into sort of methods that might, um, you know, allow for dependence between an efficiency move and changes in um, labor force or labor related things um, is something that um, is a limitation for sure. And um, we did send this paper to one place and it got rejected very quickly. And, um, and I'm sure it was rejected um, by an economist. <laughs> because, um, and so I've rewritten some of it because I think that, um, you know, uh, we weren't engaging with the, you know, sort of part of, you know, this happens, right, to, to when you do things in a discipline that you're not also, doing. I guess you might also have to have to address the question of why not use longitudinal data when globalization has led to many of the polluting industries being offshore. And whether yeah. you couldn't gain the same kind of insights from that study, right? Yes, and um, one of the hypotheses that we have heard, of, we have we have on our radar is this sort of like offshoring question as to like what what the role of that is, and and also just you know um, I think that another thing we've talked about is like is there a way to well first of all value add data for sure. And um, like the role of regulatory restrictions, because there are rules in place now. So, you know, those need to be in there. And then um, the other thing was this notion of like industries that are like somehow critical or, or, or you know, having something that like talks about like, okay, well, it, this isn't going to be like ubiquitous applied to everything. Like there are critical industries that are going to have emissions. And that's part of like, that's, and so incorporating stuff like that are things that you know, we're moving towards, I think that this project was, um, was sort of um, a thought experiment in a lot of ways. So um, it's, it's just a first pass. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, nice qualification, Mary. And I think we're going to run out of time, but I'm just really enjoying, it's lovely to see people just kind of dig into the nuts and bolts of design here. I was always a good signal of a talk. I'm going to let Emmanuel, uh, close with the last question since we are largely out of time and apologies to the rest. But thanks, Emmanuel, uh, go ahead. Thanks, Terry. Um, uh, yeah, thank you so much for the for such an interesting talk. Um, <clears throat> I I was wondering, like, when you talked about these different industries, right? And when you mentioned the shutdown, ten percent shutdown, full shutdown. So, do you mean by the ten percent shutdown? Do you mean the loss of production of the of that industry is that what you meant yes we we um looked at as that that is like the nuclear option you know we shut down every single facility in that industry um or we eliminated their pollution and and their and every you know every job in that industry and you know part of that was just to show that you don't have to do that you right. know rather than anything that anyone would ever do um, right so, um, so yeah the so my intention for this question was not every industry, like it's for some industries, especially um, difficult to have a shutdown, like the ones which are continuous production compared to the ones which are like more on a batch mode. So for them, it might be easier to shut down and then go back to full production. But for some which are like say the chemical processing industries or the other processing industries, you know, the in the downstream of oil and gas, petrochemical and chemicals. So I'm just wondering, like, can we have shutdowns like this, um, you know, shutting down a continuous process like that? So that's one question, like if you can have that. And if you have looked into uh, different pollution control systems for those particular industries, because different industries will have different end of pipe systems. And for that, we need different end of pipe, different technologies and which could give us significant reductions in different kinds of emissions. Yeah. Um, so I was wondering if, I mean, if you've looked into those, you know, those different ways of reducing pollution compared to shutting them down. Um, well, I'll go on the record and say like, we're not, we're not at all advocating for any shutdown. It's really a point of comparison. 
Um, and so I don't think that that's a palatable um, suggestion, um, m like fr from us, right? Like we wouldn't, we're, we're using those really as comparison points that like you don't actually need to do that because sometimes there is sort of like these, you know, broad stroked uh, calls to eliminate industries and, and that's certainly not what we were, we're thinking of. Um, not that that wouldn't be possible or we wouldn't, wouldn't be a good idea in some scenarios, but it, it wasn't, it wasn't something that, and so thinking about like the, you know, the, um, how nimble an industry is to sort of turn off the switch and turn on the switch is something that we didn't, we didn't consider. Um, but your second question, um, about, um, you know, efficiencies and pollution control options and stuff, um, you know, we've done a lot of work with um, people at EPA that are interested in this, you know, really using this pollution prevention law to the best they can. And um, one of the things that they're interested in is, is really matching facilities to understand like, okay, well, this facility took a pollution prevention action at the process level. And, you know, so, you know, po po possibly the best way to think about pollution reduction is, is not at the facility level. It's at the chemical level or about the process level or at the, you know, action level, right? Instead of at this more aggregated level. And so I yes. think like breaking down industrial processes to, you know, sub, you know, building level, right? Mm -hmm. Is something that I think it will be really important. And, um, um, and that's really how the pollution prevention law is meant to act. And, um, and then uh, I would say that, that from there, you know, you might get a, a sort of a clear inroad into like what this one facility could do. And honestly, like all of that should be complicated by the supply chain and how all these yeah. industries are related to one another. Because for example, like we've also been doing a bunch of work in the petrochemical refinery industry and you know that's an industry that's like part of a really long supply chain and so understanding like where do these emissions really come from and i mean they're not even us based in some ways and like our data are only us data at this point but so it's like it's a it's a big socio environmental system right that has a yeah. lifetime of 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 you know a career's worth of research to work on if you're interested in it but um but so we under i think we we understand those complexities in some ways but um you know, it's a, it takes a really sort of big team to, to have That's all fair. of that, that type of yeah. information. So, but I really appreciate your question and like, it totally reflects like what the reality is in ways that like this paper was sort of a toy example. So. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mary. I think I'll probably run out of time though. I'm sure I'm gonna send you a few questions. I'm sure there's other. Yeah, and I, I mean, people, if anyone, yeah. my contact information is there too. So if you're interested, you're, you can totally contact me. And great talk. Thank you. Thank you for the quality of conversation you inspired afterwards and the talk, even if it is a thought experiment, as you say, it's a great one to follow and, and opens many more doors than it closes. So great. Thank you. Uh, and good to see you. So thank you, everyone. We will see you next week. And huge thanks to Mary. I'm going to use you. my clapping reaction. <laughs> so, and uh, yeah, thanks again. I'll be in touch about... Um, a few and I've saved the chat here, Mary, so I'll send it to you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right. Bye, All right. everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Bye.